Have you ever wanted to get into the Xbox One or just want some general information on the system? Well, then this is the video for you. We'll cover things like hardware revisions, accessories, and games, among other things. As some of you know, I do have a pretty extensive console collection. While just having a couple of systems here and there would cover most of the games I would want to play, I instead prefer to spread out my games over several consoles in order to get a feel of how gaming is on all these different gaming systems. It's the differences that make each system unique, and that's something I enjoy experiencing. My newest acquisition is the Xbox One, which I bought last year. Out of all the 8th gen systems, the Xbox One was the only one I didn't have any experience with, so I wanted to see what it's like for myself. And it turns out, I really enjoy it. I think the hardware looks good, the controller has some really nice things about it, there's 4K Blu-ray capability, it has backwards compatibility with certain Xbox and Xbox 360 games, and the Game Pass service is really compelling, especially if you're someone who plays games on PC as well. Let's start with an overview of the hardware first. Overall, there's four different devices. The original Xbox One, the Xbox One S and the One S Digital Edition, and the Xbox One X. Microsoft really likes to go off the deep end with how numbers are used. It should have been just called the Xbox 3, and don't be surprised if I call it that later in the video. Out of all the Xbox 3s, the one most people should probably look at is the Xbox One S. And here's why. The original system, while being able to play all of the games, does lack HDR, which I'm sure a lot of people are fine with, but you can't have it sit vertically. Since the OG system is a bit of a chunky mofo, certain people may not be able to set it up the way they want to. The Xbox One S can sit horizontally or vertically, plus it's considerably smaller. The S also supports 4K streaming and 4K Blu-ray, which the original doesn't. So that may be a big deal depending on what you want to use it for. Ironically, despite Blu-ray being a Sony-made format, none of the PS4s can play 4K Blu-ray. The Xbox One X is the one you want if you want better performance and 4K resolution. Even at 1080p, there's a number of games that just run better than they do on the original system or the S. Also, compared to the PS4 Pro, the One X is consistently better at doing 4K at 60fps. While with the PS4 Pro, it really depends on the game. The Xbox One X is the more expensive system of the two, which would explain the difference in power. Interestingly, when it comes to the regular versions of both systems, most games actually run better on the PS4. There are several occasions where the Xbox One version has lower resolution, lower res textures, and things like that. I wouldn't really recommend the digital-only Xbox One S. Yes, you do save a bit of money, but then you lose the 4K Blu-ray support, and if that doesn't matter to you, what if you ever find some physical games for cheap? Can't play those then. The Xbox One is actually, generally speaking, a really good all-in-one entertainment device, especially the One S. I think that one's the best in terms of value, like I said. It plays games, does Blu-ray, and it's able to stream most of the popular video streaming services. Considering all it does, it's a pretty good bargain, especially if you want a 4K Blu-ray player. Since, uh, as far as I know, it's like one of the cheaper ones that does 4K. Plus, you can obviously play games with it too. Let's talk about accessories now. The controller is quite interesting. It features several things that I really like about it. I've always liked the shape of the 360 controller, and the Xbox 3 controller is quite similar, which is good because I think it's quite nice to hold. It also uses double A batteries, which I always prefer. I can't stand all these devices where you need to replace the internal lithium ion battery, you know, like 10 years down the line with some dodgy eBay battery that may or may not be crap. Rechargeable double A batteries is all you need. You can always get rechargeable battery kits if you want lithium ion -ness, but it does add to the overall cost, of course. The haptic feedback is pretty nice too. It's a subtle thing where you think, oh, that's cool when you first experience it, but when you go back to, let's say, the PS4, you really notice the lack of it. Unfortunately, the Xbox One controller feels a bit cheap. I think it's due to how light it is. I wouldn't say the materials are cheap themselves, but perhaps it's more of a mental thing where I perceive it to feel cheap because heaviness is associated with quality. Also, the face buttons aren't really super nice to press. They make up a bit of a hollow sound. It's a bit, you know, clacky sounding. We can't speak about controllers without talking about the Elite controller. There's actually two versions, which are, believe it or not, numbered in sequence. The Elite controller and Elite controller series 2. Imagine if they called the second one the Elite controller 360. That would have just been silly. Both are customizable and also a lot more expensive than their standard counterpart. Some people may wonder why you'd spend over double the price of a standard controller, 
But once you start looking at gaming keyboard and mouse prices, then an Elite controller doesn't seem too outlandish if you want to enhance and customize your experience, especially if it's your primary way of gaming. Both the Elite controllers have paddles on the back, they have carrying cases and extra thumbsticks and D-pads, but the second iteration does have some extra nice bits like a 40 hour plus battery, USB-C, tension adjustable thumbsticks, charging dock and case, and Bluetooth connectivity. So in other words, you can use it on uh, devices without having to use that USB thing. People seem to recommend getting the Series 2 controller, citing, you know, not just features, but durability as the main reasons. I don't have experience with these Elite controllers myself, but there are several reviews and comparisons that you can find online, so check those out if you want more info. You may want to look into getting a stand for your console. You can get the basic ones, which are just basically, you know, overpriced pieces of plastic. There are some more elaborate ones that introduce controller chargers and game holders to the mix. Since they don't cost that much more, it might be worth looking into depending on how helpful the features are to you. Like the PS4, the Xbox One doesn't support regular Bluetooth headphones. This stuff shouldn't be too hard these days, honestly. I mean, the Vita allowed you to use whatever Bluetooth headphones you wanted. So I'm guessing this is just a way to force people to buy a PS4 or Xbox One compatible headset. There is, however, a 3.5mm headphone jack on the controller, so at least there's that. Something to look into if you're using the thing for shows and movies is a remote. They're cheap and convenient, so why not? Saves you from having to turn on the controller after it automatically shuts off. There's a couple of different ways of expanding storage. The easiest but dangliest part is just adding some sort of external drive and connecting it via a USB port. But it is possible to replace the hard drive inside. It's just a regular laptop spec 2.5 SATA thing. It's not as easy as the PS4 in terms of, you know, swapping the drives out because the Xbox One needs to be disassembled more. And it's not all screws, there's some things that are snap-in. From the tutorials I've watched, it doesn't look too difficult, but anybody not used to that sort of thing might be hesitant to attempt to do that. And before putting the new drive in, you need to connect it to a computer and put the operating system on there. At least it's not as bad as the Xbox One. Uh, I mean, the very first Xbox, I mean where you have to put in a mod chip in order for the thing to be able to use a hard drive not paired to the system. When it comes to accessories, of course we have to talk about the Kinect. It's an interesting thing. It's a specialty item that most people probably aren't going to get. And most people obviously didn't because it was discontinued after all. As you probably know, the Kinect is a motion tracking system with cameras and microphone that allows you to not just use motion, but also voice to control various things. It first appeared on the 360, but it's Microsoft's initial integration with the Xbox One which really caused a stir. And not in a good way. People did not like the always-on aspects of the console. Not that we don't have stuff currently with microphones in various devices. But people were a bit more afraid of Microsoft capturing perhaps one-handed gaming imagery with the built-in camera. Another thing was the fact that in the beginning Microsoft planned for the Xbox One to only work if it had a connect, well, connected. Despite reversing these decisions before launch, the Kinect wasn't exactly seen in a good light by most people, hence the lack of popularity. There are a few games that can take advantage of the Kinect, but don't expect a lot. There is a list in the description if you want to see what games have Kinect support. If you want to pick up a Kinect, make sure that you get a USB adapter if you have a 1S or X, because they don't have dedicated Kinect ports, unlike the original. Alright, let's talk about games, as in the normal ones. Unlike previous console generations, this time around there just aren't as many exclusives. So most beloved franchises are available on the Xbox. Of course there are exclusives though, Halo is an obvious one. There's the Master Chief Collection, which is a great way to play the older games again. Though that's also available on PC, but not on PS4 anyways, or the Switch. One thing I really like is that you can play with the old graphics or the remastered ones. Gears of War games are another example there. Forza Motorsport and Horizon games are also popular Xbox games, though uh, the fourth Horizon game is also playable on PC. But again, the point is that they're not found on any other console. There's of course more exclusives, but uh, those are probably the most noteworthy ones. Something the Xbox One is pretty good at is backwards compatibility. Not just with the 360, but also original Xbox games. Of course, not every game works, but the ones that do often run and look a bit better than the originals. For example, Red Dead Redemption is best played on the Xbox One. 
and the One X can even run it natively at 4K. It's actually kind of interesting how the Xbox One handles backwards compatibility. When you put an older game in, the Xbox just downloads the ported or adapted version rather than just reading the stuff off the disc. But that also means that the list of older games that are playable isn't that big. I can't play any of my older Dead or Alive games, for example, which I think is a real shame. They're just some of the most noteworthy games on the original Xbox. Not to mention, what about the Forza games? Like, I'd love to be able to play some of the older ones. But it's still much better than how Sony does it with the PS4. Like, let's say if you want to play a PS3 game, then it's, you know, that's tied to the PS Now service. And it actually looks worse than the original games because of the compression artifacts, since it's just, you know, an, it's just an image that's streamed to you. Since I play Japanese games a lot, especially the more niche stuff, I think it's worth touching on that subject now. The Xbox One sold horrifically in Japan, and you can't even buy them new over there. Because of this, a lot of Japanese developers have decided to just kind of, you know, ignore the system. But at the same time, because the PS4 and Xbox One share a common architecture, and porting is relatively easy compared to the PS3 and Xbox 360 era, there are some Japanese games that have Xbox One ports. For example, there's Valkyria Chronicles 1 and 4, Nier Automata looks and runs very well too, a lot of the more mainstream-leaning franchises also make an appearance, like Final Fantasy, Metal Gear... I wrote Metal Gear twice in my script for some reason, uh, Monster Hunter, and literally every fighting game. But if you're looking at some more niche stuff, then you're probably out of luck. Something that's an interesting topic is Xbox Game Pass. I've got some conflicting feelings about video game subscriptions. I like physical media. That's not a surprise to anyone who watches the channel. But at the same time, subscriptions can offer a lot of value. One of the more popular game subscription services is Xbox Game Pass. There's three different types. One is for the Xbox, another for PC, and then there's Game Pass Ultimate, which is just both. I have Ultimate because last year they had a pretty good deal where you could upgrade your Xbox Live Gold to Ultimate for just a dollar. For me, it's great because I play on PC a lot. Is it worth the full price? Well, I'll have to think about it before it expires in about a year's time. But right now it's quite nice. Even just for the channel, since it allows me to experience more games and also record footage of games I actually don't own, for whatever reason. It's a bit strange though, because I've had the system for maybe a bit over a year, and I don't even have a physical game for it yet because of Game Pass. I'm sure that'll change once the new Xbox is out and games become super cheap. I'll probably pick up more stuff then, especially if I decide to let my subscription lapse. So in the end, the Xbox One is pretty interesting. The PS4 certainly has won in terms of sales, and I think the reason for that isn't necessarily because it's a clear-cut better product. One thing to consider with the Xbox is that there was a lot of backlash in the beginning because of the things Microsoft was trying to implement, mainly the always-on connect, as well as physical copies being tied to a person's account without being able to transfer the license, which would have effectively killed the used game market for the system. Despite Microsoft reversing their original plans before launch, it still left a sour taste in people's mouth, and the resulting smaller market base meant that in case of multi-platform releases, developers decided to sometimes not quite put in the required time to optimize everything correctly. Hence, we have some games that don't look that great or perform that well, compared to the PS4 versions but it turned into a pretty good device that is not just able to play games, but also provides a lot of multimedia features. Given the changes that we are seeing in the video game industry, the Xbox One will probably have an interesting place in history in regards to subscription services, digital distribution, and always-on services. So in that regard, I'll think it'll be an interesting console to have in your collection, as well as to collect for. So that's the Xbox One. I hope you enjoyed this overview of the system, if you like what I do, check out Patreon, where you get a bunch of benefits, including behind-the-scenes updates, early access to videos, and more. You can also support the channel by purchasing something off the merch store. Links to everything can be found in the description. And here's the list of names of Tier 3 Patreon supporters. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video.